ever been called into a position of leadership, but you don't feel like you're a leader? You know, the answer to that question for me is a whole lot. I have been in many positions where I'm asking myself, am I up to this task? And sometimes myself answers and it's on schizophrenic way. No, you're not, Tom. And so I don't feel like I'm a leader. So you're in this revitalization. However, you determine a revitalization, probably nine out of 10 churches need some form of revitalization. And you're asking the question, can I do this? Well, the answer is yes. We are going to take three episodes to explain this whole thing about leadership and revitalization and the mist of doubt. And Mark Clifton and I will be, I think, providing you some encouraging information. With that, good morning, Mark. Good morning. I hope it's encouraging. I, I do. We're gonna we're gonna work at that. So, I've I've always felt like I'm not a leader, and uh, some people have told me that even. So you know, over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Nellie Joe just left to go get her hair done. She told me that right. No, she didn't. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes, le- leadership in the home, leadership at the church, leadership in your organization. Well, sometimes you don't feel like a leader and sometimes you really want to be a good leader in a revitalization because you know it's desperately needed. So we're going to take three parts. And in this first part, we're going to talk about why you may not think you are a leader. Uh, Everybody has gone through some of these doubts, even those who seem as confident as ever has come up. Uh, across some of these issues. We're going to be talking about that. And Mark and I, I hope will offer not only some encouragement for some insights on how to move forward when you don't think that you are a leader. So Mark, the first thing we got to do is admit that leadership is ill-defined. I mean, you can, you can find, let me put it this way. It's well-defined probably 5,000 times. Who knows what it means to be a leader, right? Yes. Everybody has a different opinion of what it means to be a leader. And people in your church or people that you are leading have a different opinion of what it is to be a leader. You right. can lead you can lead five or six people and one or two of them think you're the best leader we've ever had. And two or three of them say you wouldn't you, you couldn't lead me out of a wet paper bag. So, yes. I mean, it, it's it's a real challenge sometimes that that term. And um, look, I, 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 I personally struggle with it tremendously. Um yeah, I, I before I became a replanter, I was a planter, and uh, way back in the day, man. I mean, you know, we're talking long time ago, uh, late seventies, early eighties. My job was to go to a place and start a new church, uh, get it, go go where there was nothing, literally, no no church at all, and it was, I was called a church starter strategist, and I would go to a place where there wasn't any church, and I would just do some evangelistic work and some cultivative work and and gather a group of people together for a Bible study, maybe another group, maybe another group, and then eventually sort of form a little thing that might be the nucleus of a new church. But I would pass it off to someone who had real leadership ability, right, that could plant mm-hmm. that church. I was considered the church planter, and the guy that I brought on was the founding pastor. Now, okay. before I bore you, before I bore you entirely, that was because I just didn't see myself as having real leadership skills. I could work okay by myself. I could do some things. I could be evangelistic. I could be disciple making, but I just didn't see myself as the kind of. And so I did that twelve times, ten or twelve times, planted churches that way. But I never stayed more than eighteen months, and I was on to something else, on to another one. All right, when well, God well, stop, stop, to go stop, to stop a minute, stop yeah, a minute. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. want to diagnose you. Uh, this, this yeah. get, get on, get on your uh, figurative therapy couch. Cause All I right. want to diagnose you. What right, were you, you doing in those 18 months? I was being a leader. <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> I was going to let you describe things and walk into I, the trap. I realize where you're going with that. Yes. And the reason I realize where you're going with that is, you know, fast forward to when I'm, the associate director of missions in Kansas city and this dying church needs help. And I'm going to go in and just spend about 18 months and help them find a founding pastor. That's at Warner road. And God called me to stay there. And I had this conversation literally with God saying, God, I am not a leader. I can't stay in a place this long. And God revealed to me every one of those places where we started a new church, I was a leader. And so yeah, sometimes it would be a- it's the go self on, doubt. Sometimes it's yes. the self doubt. It's the self doubt. We have more leadership ability than we're we're leading somebody all the time. Is that where you're headed with this? We I are, hope. and and Thank and you. I'm, that is part of where we're headed with. Another part is uh, sometimes we have these preconceived ideas of what leadership is, 
and we yeah. have it, but we don't put it within that definition. Yeah. Yeah. And that was my case. I was not what I saw as a leader, which would be like, you know, um, uh, who was the back back in the eighties? Who was the guy that that saved Chrysler? Remember him, Lee Iacocca, right? Lee you know? Iacocca, yes. Lee Iacocca, yeah. You know, that's a leader. I mean, that's a yes. leader, right? The guy comes in, he's been in the car business forever, saves a whole a whole a uh, whole car dealership. I mean, a whole car line, uh, and uh, you know, writes all these books. And I think I'm I'm not like that. You know, I I can't even balance my checkbook. I'm I'm not a leader. You know, I. <laughs> I, I had a boss one time that said I look like an unmade bed most of the time. So I figured, you know, I'm not <laughs> actually that's true. He was I was I was planting a new church and the director of missions there in that association, that's a regional guy for Southern Baptist. There was a pastor that wanted to meet me and he said, Well he will be at this uh this Denny's for lunch. And come on in and just just hit, well, the guy said, What's he look like? He said, Well, he looks like he's like an unmade bed. You can't miss him. So I never lived that, that down. That, that is that is a true friend that describes anybody <laughs> that that way. But think about it, Mark, what you were doing within those 18 months. And I don't want to make you apostolic, but that's what the Apostle Paul was doing for different periods of times. But he would go from one to another, one to another. And he right. he gets pretty good cred as a leader these days as we look back. So another famous business leader that really uh, came to fame somewhat parallel with Iacocca, but also past that time was Jack Welch, GE. Yes, and absolutely. I I am reading a book called Power Failure. And okay. fantastic book. It's not the book about Welch. It's the book about GE and its history, but it obviously has a prominent part in it. But listen to the thesis of the author. It's in the title, Power Failure, the Leadership Power failed. And he pretty much makes tries to make the case that every one of these leaders, instead of growing GE to where we this behemoth that it ultimately became, ultimately are leading to his downfall. This is beginning to fragment. And then mm. it's 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 somewhat complimentary of Welch, but it's also saying, hey, there's a reality. Do you remember the classic John Maxwellian, John Maxwell definition of leadership, Mark? Do you remember that one? Well, it has something to do. If, if you're a leader, people will follow you or if you're moving, something like it, that. I've, exactly. That right? He put it, he put it like in three that. words. He put it in three yeah. words. Leadership is influence. Okay. There you go. Great. We have this concise, great definition, but then we sometimes doubt that we have influence on anybody or some people overestimate their influence on people. I've been Whoa. in leadership roles. Where, where I thought I had done a great job influencing people. And I found out after I've gone, I really stunk at some of the things that I did. So even if we go with a definition, now we have to define influence. It's not a perfect definition. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I think sometimes we do look in the secular world. You know, I did write an, a blog some time ago that got some attention um, about my dad uh, because I, I said in the blog at the beginning, I said, everything rises and falls on leadership. I mean, how many times? There's, that's Maxwell again. Know. Yeah, everything rises and falls on leadership. Yes, that's true. But no, not on the kind of way we may define leadership. In other words, what I was getting at was what you were talking about. Because I, I talked about my dad, who had basically two churches, his entire ministry, both of them were highly successful, grew tremendously. But more importantly than that, my dad loved people. He baptized so many folks. He raised up so many pastors that became very successful pastors. Like, you know how you have NFL coaches that have a coaching tree? My dad had a pastor tree. I mean, he had guys that pastored and they, they trained pastors and, and, and just, he was just a very successful, never had a church split, never had a church fight. Every church loved him to death. But I said, you know, what, he was never a leader in anything else in life. He, he didn't excel in school. He wasn't a leader in school. He wasn't a leader in the military. He was a Second World War. He wasn't in any kind of leadership role there. Didn't rise to any kind of leadership role there. He never led anything in his school. He went to William Jewell College. He wasn't a leader there. My dad wasn't a leader. He wasn't a leader in the community. He wasn't a leader in the non I mean, in a sense, you'd look at my dad, and he was quiet and gentle and humble. And you'd say, well, he's not, you know, he doesn't walk in up and fill up a room. Mm -hmm. But he had tremendous influence on people. And, and so I wrote this blog and I said, everything rises and falls, exactly. not on leadership, but on really on, on the influence that you have with people. 
And I've seen some guys, Dr. Rayner, who who are great leaders as, as the corporate world or the secular world counts leaders, but they can't get anybody in the church to follow them. I mean, they, they really can't. They, they cause division rather than unity. So now that I've muddied the waters, but I, I was thinking about that well, with my dad as we thought about this. Now, your dad, on I, the other hand, you haven't muddied the waters. Right. No, I mean, not really. I thought your dad was a mayor. Well, let's, let's look at it. OK. Of a town with a population of 3,704 in the 1960 <laughs> census. Ask me how I remember that. I have no idea. <laughs> Union Springs, Alabama. I mean, they, you, you go to the University of Alabama football game and, and there's a, a hundred thousand more people than we're in the population of Union Springs. All right. My, that, my, I'll my, give you that. All right. My dad came back from World War II. He got a job at a bank. Uh, he was a third generation banker. I was a no, he was a fourth generation. I was a fifth generation when I went into banking. All of my sons went into banking before ministry. They were sixth generation bankers. But it was a tiny bank in a community bank in a small town. He was mayor of that small town. But you know my biggest memory of him? I think I've probably Why? stated on this podcast, if not Rainer on leadership. He and George Wallace who later became governor, were at each other all the time. My dad was an unusual white person who was not a racist in the 60s in South Alabama. George Wallace was the epitome of segregation, racism. And George Wallace was the judge in my hometown. Dad was the mayor, and they did not like each other. And I have vivid memories of Dad in one of his rare outbursts. He was very, very circumspect and quiet as well, like your dad. But they were arguing about something, and I heard my dad raise his voice and say, George, all you are is a little Jesus. You think you are a Messiah. And I just said, <laughs> whoa. <And> that, <laughs> <laughs> so my my dad no he 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 is not in the annals of any history world war ii hero yes but not in the annals of history bank president yes tiny mayor tiny all of those things okay and then we say well, leadership is influence or everything rises and falls on leadership but we can't define what influence is <laughs> or we may not know it and we may not know what rise and fall means so we still for that it's an ambiguous term i gotta get the second point all right all right so the second point is this Church members can create doubt and uncertainty in the heart of the revitalization leader. They can beat up the leader, the pastor particularly, so much that you begin to have self-doubt because you're reflecting what they said. And if you're not creating some angst in them, if you're truly in a revitalizing situation, the church is truly yes. declining, and you're not creating some level of discomfort and angst, you're not leading them anywhere. That's um, right. That just goes with it. Again, it's the drowning swimmer, right? You're, if He's going to fight you all the way to the shore, but he's going to be grateful when you get him there. I mean, if he's not yes. fighting, you're just you're just out there drowning with him, frankly. So yes. that's that's a natural statement that you're going to a natural result of leadership is you're going to cause some people, especially when you're an agent of change used by the Holy Spirit. You're going to cause some people to have to deal with some idols in their life and they're not going to like that. That's exactly right. And so we are listening to the voices of these dissidents and sometimes they don't have the best motive at heart. And we begin to believe them, even though we may say, uh, I'm just letting it pass on. I'm, I'm not worried about it. I'm not one of those guys who can say I'm not worried about it. I soak it in too much. I mean, I get <laughs> criticized and, you know, it's fetal position in the corner for three hours for me. But yeah, you know. I've gotten better at that. But, man, I, I agree that has always been a problem. And we've talked on many occasions about how depression and discouragement is one of right. Satan's greatest tools. And, and that, that kind of over introspection into what people are saying about us leads, can lead us to depression and discouragement. It really can. Well, the, rather, the, than the, the, listening to what, rather than listening to what the Holy Spirit says us, we listen exactly. to what people say about us. Yeah. The, the cliche that has been said, and I often don't, I don't even want to repeat it because it's so cliche, is that don't believe everything that people say is great about you. Don't believe everything that people say is bad about you. Uh, it's or some form thereof. You're going to get criticisms and that can create self-doubt. And you can all of a sudden say, well, I'm not a leader. Well, it may be that the criticisms are coming because you are a leader and you right. are a change leader. And we've right. got to keep that in mind. OK, next point is this. Another reason many leaders don't feel like they are leaders or don't think that they're leaders. They look at the revitalization task before them and it looks like this big 
obstacle, almost an insurmountable obstacle. And they began to question, how can I lead our people through this or over this or around this obstacle? Rather than thinking, how can I lead them today? How can I make the next step with them? Um, I do think sometimes the, the overall picture does seem overwhelming, but we're called to be faithful in the moment at this time with what we have today. And then when we look back and we see all that we've accomplished, we'll be really surprised by it. I do think that that's an important perspective to have. You walk into a church that seats 500, there's 15 people there and they fussed and fought for 15 years and, and it is overwhelming, right? But what you do is you start with the ones you have. You start with those 15 and you love them and you lead them and you try to look into the community and you try to find one or two people in the community you can share Jesus with and you just start doing small things like that. And sometimes we think, well, we look at stories of guys who went to churches like that and in two years, it's 300 people. And we, we say, I don't have that kind of ability. Well, I would tell you that after um, 40 years of ministry, literally almost every time there's a huge story like that, there's a backstory you haven't heard and I haven't heard that kind of tells you why that happened. Most of the time, it's, it's just a long, continued faithfulness in one direction that leads to a church being turned around, not something that happens within six months or eight months or anything like that. It's just the faithfulness day in and day out of a leader to do what God's called him to do in that place at that time with what he has. Hey, I, we, we both talked about parents. Uh, I, I'm probably going to go overboard on this with uh, three sons, but I just, I just want to tell you how I see them in the context of this. And I hope the audience will forgive me about being so familial in some of my illustrations. My youngest son uh, is in his third church plant, but the first two, he was the ex executive pastor, number two man, and he moved on and he moved on. And then he came to his current church plant and he is the lead pastor. He has been there. He is in his seventh year. And, you know, there, he just has had his moments where he thinks, can I lead this? And now we look from where it started in his family room to where it is today. I'm not going to give numbers, but it's been a great, great fruit that he has seen. He doesn't always see himself as a leader. He, in fact, he's told me, dad, I'm not a leader. I said, well, somebody did this. You and the Holy spirit must have done something, something together. And then art, art is in the area of Christian finance. He loves to help people understand biblical generosity. And he's just been plugging away at this for years, Mark, it, uh, getting an MBA, getting a PhD in business, getting, and then now, going out on his own fearfully. I know going out on his own for, but he's just chipped away one thing at a time. Sam's in a revitalization in Bradenton, Florida. He's in his eighth year and he's had moments. In fact, he had a big exit of people uh, at one point And he just said, am I really a leader when I lose 75 people at one time and uh, give all the details of that, but I won't. All three of them have had self doubts, but they persevered. And that's, I guess, you know, Mike Glenn used to be my pastor. He's the pastor of Brentwood Baptist Church in Tennessee. And uh, he, people say, how have you lasted almost 30 years? He says, well, here's what I do. I get up in the morning, I get dressed, and I go to work. And I do it the next day and the next mm. day and the mm. next day. And he's had, his, even though he's a pastor for a large church, he's had his doubts as well. Too many illustrations, too much about family, Mark. Well, my point I think is, it's right. I, I think sometimes we look at leadership and we try to we try to project, you know, what I'm going to do for the next five years. And you can just be the leader you need to be today. Uh, just yes. seek, seek the Lord for his direction today uh, and see that. But, yes, I agree. Leadership's hard to define. And sometimes we get self-doubts because we listen to outside people tell us things that, that aren't necessarily true. Absolutely. Totally. Well, Happened to the, me all this, the time. This, this, this last point is our biblical illustration. Get away from the Cliftons and the Rainers for just a moment and talk, talk about a biblical illustration. Moses is one of the classic examples of someone who did not think he was a leader and told God he didn't think he was a leader. And God pretty much said, oh, who's going to handle this, me or you? And right. if Moses could come through with this, he stuttered. He doubted his leadership. He was fearful of the Egyptians. We could go on and on. He was ticked off at the Jews. He wondered if right. he could lead them through the promised land. We could right. go on and on. But that's a right. great example of, of someone who didn't think he was a leader. 
You know, Charles Spurgeon, in his lectures to my students, said, Whoever, whatever your strength is, your innate strength in your personality or your skills, be cautious of that, because that in ministry, that can become your greatest weakness. And I think some men who feel like they have real leadership ability will depend on that leadership ability rather than depending on the Holy Spirit. And going back to my dad, I think he felt always like he didn't have the ability to really lead people. So it forced him daily to lean on the Holy Spirit. And what happened was, as my dad led, he was leading in a spirit-led way. Mm -hmm. People weren't following Harry Clifton. They were following a man of God, all right? And I think they saw that in him, and they followed that leadership, not his innate, you know, hey, I could go out and start a business, or I could build an insurance company, or I could get men to follow me into battle, because he couldn't have done any of that. But he knew how to spend time with Jesus. He knew how to be intimate with the Lord. He knew how to reflect Christ in his life. And people were drawn to that. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And I do know they weren't drawn to necessarily to my dad's leadership. They were drawn to my dad's intimacy with Jesus. And he led through that. So I think that's the lesson we need to learn from this today. That is a powerful lesson. And just as a, not a postscript, but a continuation of what you just said, your dad had to be a great leader because he f- influenced you and look at the influence you have today. So he did not he necessarily did at that me. moment. Moses did not get to go into the promised land. Sometimes we don't always see the fruit of our leadership. Your dad, the fruit is very evident right now. Uh, I, I just, this is, I've never shared this with anybody and uh, I hope people will understand it's shared. It's shared in humility. All right. But this seems to be the place to share this. When, when I was young, we went to the Southern Baptist annual convention every year. It was a big deal in my dad's life, my mom's life. They met their friends there and and they just had a great time. And the one thing my dad always looked forward to and my mother was the, the SBC's pastors conference, which is an event that takes place a couple of days before the convention. And uh, you remember, Tom, back in the 60s and 70s, the pastor's conference was really huge. And Mm -hmm. uh, and my dad loved to go to that. And he passed away five or six years ago. But um, I remember he he used to always be so enamored with the guys who were preaching at the pastor's conference. And um, I remember I first surrendered, as we say, to the ministry when I was about 15 or 16 and preached my first sermon at my dad's church on a Sunday night. And it wasn't a very good sermon by any means, but uh, he prayed with me and, you know, and and encouraged me in that. And uh, so the next year we went to the SBC and and he said, you know, Mark, I really think someday you'll, you'll be preaching there. I thought, well, that's crazy. Um, But that happened last year. And so he was in heaven. He'll find out about it when I get up there, I guess. But uh, that was the one thing I wish he could have been there because he had such an influence on my life that um, his his influence on me and his his guidance in my life and direction in my life. You're right, Tom. No one's ever really said that before, but everything I'm doing, I'm doing because of his leadership in my life, including uh, which would have been a lot to him uh, preaching there at the pastor's conference. So that is anyway. an incredible story. And it was told in humility. And I did not know that connection either. So I think that is great for our audience. And it's just a, it's a, just a great reminder. We're doing a three-part series on leading a church revitalization, even when you don't feel like a leader. We've talked about why, why some revitalization leaders don't think they're leaders. Mark and I are definitely among them. When we come back in the second episode, we're going to look at four of the more common leadership obstacles in revitalization as we talk about this whole issue of doubt. But Mark, thank you for that great story. It's a fitting conclusion to a podcast as we move forward. We're in 2023. We continue to talk about this whole series about leading church revitalization. And even when you don't feel like a leader, come back for the next episode, part two, as we look at some of the more common leadership obstacles in revitalization. We'll see you then.